thank you so much for joining today for an interactive session on climate risk pricing for financial institutions the roadmap of india i am ankit gupta uh, part of the energy and climate change team at intelicap and will be your host today we have joined by our esteemed guest and i will introduce to the, them to you shortly as well i just want to take you quickly through the agenda for today uh, we'll have initial remarks by our uh, mr uh, our ceo mr vikas pali then we'll have a special address by pustav joshi who is associate director clean energy finance shakti sustainable energy foundation on the context and relevance of the study uh, which links to climate risk mainstreaming and climate risk pricing then will i share uh, then i'll share a small presentation which captures the landscape study which we did uh, which intelicap did with support of shakti foundation on a similar topic and will share the key insights from the report and then we'll have a key a panel discussion with the key panelists uh, i will introduce the panelists uh, to you at the time of panel discussion but uh, we have been joined by five of the esteemed panelists and moderated by our team uh, with by our uh, director santosh singh just few housekeeping rules uh, we will have this discussion for the next 2 hours uh, you can you can interact with us over the chat so you can keep sharing your questions and suggestions over the chat uh, we'll try to ensure that we'll answer all your questions that you have during the discussion through the chat window um, also we are a live uh, when uh, you know live streaming the session on facebook so if you have any colleagues who couldn't join today but uh, you want them to see this session later you can uh, share, use the facebook link that we will post later and uh, and if you have any questions any concerns you can directly put in the chat or you can also put in uh, is drop in an email to me and we will ensure that we'll solve that queries and questions during the uh, during the course of this webinar uh, without further ado i would like to invite mr vikas bali the ceo of intelicap to welcome everyone and give us welcome remarks uh, thank you very much uh, ankit i hope i am audible yes sir vikas you are audible uh, good afternoon uh, everyone and good morning uh, to others who are in different time zones uh, i am delighted to have the opportunity to uh, welcome all of you on this very very interesting uh, topic and very topical as well uh given the climate change that we are uh, seeing around us uh, be it uh, the downpour in bombay that happened uh, a few days ago and the floods that are ravaging different parts of the country including states where they never happened before uh this topic uh, needs no introduction and um, at the outset let me uh, extend my thanks to shakti foundation for having given us the opportunity uh to uh, do a little deep dive and study into uh, climate risk pricing in india and globally and what could we learn uh, as we move in our journey forward this is just but one step uh, in hopefully a long journey where we will be able to support uh, financial institutions with a lot of uh, analytics a lot of information on how they should think about uh, this entire concept of climate risk pricing uh but before that um uh, just some um, metrics uh, for all of us to be on the same page uh temperatures in india have been rising and it's about uh, 0.7 degrees over the last uh, 115 odd years uh surface temperatures have again gone up uh, in the, um, and it's about uh, 1 degree on average the sea surface temperature has increased uh all of us have observed uh, the increased frequency of very heavy rainfall and then uh, very sparse rainfall uh within a monsoon period and also outside the monsoon period uh the farmers in india are clear that uh, the the monsoon has got uh, pushed out by roughly about uh, 10 to 12 days uh and so on and so forth so i think um yeah, i would be preaching to the converted um, by a waxing eloquent on the need for all of us uh, to understand this entire concept of uh, climate change and what we need to do as um, a group together the purpose of this study has been really to understand how different types of financial institutions um, uh, equity investors uh, debt capital providers and insurance companies need to look at this topic of uh, um, uh, climate change and price the climate change accordingly uh because um as uh, we all know uh, this is going to become an increasingly uh, difficult issue to comprehend uh and manage uh, with increasing episodes of um, uh, drastic changes in uh, in in the climate uh, around us 
Um, the idea of the study is, was to really look at uh, what are the best practices um, that are being undertaken by the global financial institutions, understand uh, what are the activities um, that are prevalent in India, and see what next steps are required to be achieved in order to progress on this journey uh, of understanding climate uh, risk um, uh, and uh, the pricing thereof uh, in a better manner. As I said, it's the start of a journey and hopefully uh, all of you will participate in uh, adding to this initial knowledge piece that will be shared by my colleagues today. And hopefully over a period of time, uh, we will be able to move away from episodic understanding of uh, climate risk to really building it into our processes in, uh, as financial institutions and become more adept at managing the whole problem of, um, of climate change. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, once again, welcome all of you and uh, thank uh, the Shakti Foundation for giving us the opportunity to start on this journey. Hopefully, we have many miles uh, to go before we rest. And I hand it back uh, to Ankit uh, for uh, introducing you uh, to the panel and taking the conversation forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vikas. I would now like to request Pustav Joshi, Associate Director, Clean Energy Finance, Shakti Sustainability Foundation, to share his uh, views on the climate risk pricing initiative that Shakti Foundation is taking and his insights on the findings that we have got during the course of the project. Over to you, Pustav. Thanks, Ankit. Um, so let me start by thanking Vikas, Santosh, and the entire IntelliCap team for undertaking and completing the study. And of course, of organizing this convening despite the extremely challenging circumstances that we are currently facing. Now, for those who, of you who don't know us, Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation is a philanthropic organization. We work to ensure a clean and energy secure future for India and a low carbon development pathway for India's economic development. In particular, the clean energy finance program at Shakti works towards addressing the challenges posed by climate change on our country's financial system and on the longer term climatic externalities of investing in a carbon intensive development pathway. Now it is well understood that the frequency and the severity of cli extreme climate events has been growing at an exponential rate in this country. And Vikas has pointed that out quite well in his opening. We do not need to see beyond this year itself. You know, apart from the COVID virus, a lot of our economy faces challenges in recovery from several major climate catastrophes this year. The two severe cyclones on each coast, the locust attacks in Central and North India, floods in Northeast and Maharashtra. It seems like no part of our country has been unscattered from this uh, climate change this year. Now, climate change does not just affect the agricultural sector as a lot of people tend to think in the, the financial space. Um, you know, finance, uh, the, the agricultural sector is where the damages are more apparent, but there is always damage to property, infrastructure, building stock, supply chains are disrupted, and often the small businesses, which are like the backbone of our economy, are the ones which are most effective, sometimes to the point of shutting down. And that affects the entire economy. So in this context, as a part of a larger initiative to encourage the measurement and pricing of climate risk in investment decision making, we at Shakti have supported this excellent study by IntelliCap. Now, given the concepts that climate risk are fairly new, um, this study has been intended as an exploratory study to understand how we as Indian investors understand and perceive climate risk. In today's meeting, uh, we will discuss the findings of this study and the IntelliCap team will take you through that. But we also look forward to your contribution and guidance on the way forward. So without much ado, thank you. And over to Santosh and, and he should probably take you through the findings of the study. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pustav. Um, 
I've shared the presentation with all of you, uh, but I'll just quickly take you through the findings uh, as uh, quickly uh, on, on this call as well. And then I will hand over to Santosh to take it through, take everyone through the panel discussion. So, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, we did a landscape study as suggest, uh, as mentioned by Vikas and Pustav uh, on climate risk pricing approaches for investment portfolios and financial institutions in India. Um, I'll quickly take you that, you know, we all understand that the climate risks are divided into two parts, the physical risks and the transition risk. Physical risks are further divided into the acute hazards, which, you know, which can be um, cyclones, wildfire floods, which can happen or, you know, which can have a catastrophic impact on the lifestyle. And there are some chronic hazards as well that are higher temperatures, sea level rise, glacial melting, which have a longer impact on the uh, precipitation patterns, water availability, and impact the life cycle of the human being. Then we have transition risks, which are policy hazards that the policy changes or the technology hazards, which you know impact the, uh, the human cycle and the, and the impact on the life cycle as well. So there are multiple risks, level of risks that the climate can be, that climate causes on an individual, and we need to cognizant of both of them, of the physical as well as transition risk. But what is climate risk pricing for that matter? We understand the climate risk, but we're not considering climate risks pricing in our investment decisions. So it needs to be involved and it needs to be considered at all the levels, at the portfolio level, at the product designing level, as well as the evaluation level by the financial institutions. For example, in the regions or in the areas where there's a greater climate risk, the price of the capital can be higher. So you know you need to be cognizant of the fact that the climate risks is considered while making investment decisions. Anyone focusing on it? Is, is, is anyone taking a conscious decision towards it to ensure that climate risks are considered? Yes, there was a task force on climate related financial disclosures, which has been created in around 2015-16, conceptualized in 15-16. And they talk about that there is a need to have the climate risk considerations, not in just the governance level, but it also at the risk management strategy. And you have to have specific matrices and targets to ensure that you manage the climate risks and report them in all the evaluations and the considerations that you made. So you need to have the board, you have the members to think about it, to discuss about it, and also include it strategically in all your conversations and discussions with the specific metrics to measure it. Very, uh, so we, when we did our landscape study, we realized that there are very few financial institutions from India who have been part of this TCFD, and few of them are been EQ, BS Bank, and others. But there are much more than 800 global financial institutions who are part of it who are consciously talking about climate risk and need to undertake that climate risk, want to take the climate risk. And that's where we realized that we should do, we should, we, we, we should do this study to understand more the perspective of the financial institutions. Are they aware about climate risk pricing? Are there any methods or ways that has been implemented by them? What are the challenges and what are some of the recommendations to ensure that climate risk pricing has been or could be implemented by financial institutions in India? And in that regard, we have spoken to more than 50 stakeholders. Some of them are uh, available with us today as a speaker and we'll share, hear more from their perspective. But yes, we did the study and we, we we would like to share the insights which we have from there today, as well as in the due course. So what, what were some of the discussions that we have with financial institutions? So financial institutions, we understand that majority of them are not even aware about climate risk pricing frameworks such as TCFT. Even if they are aware, they're not undertaking climate risk pricing strategies due to lack of understanding or availability of models in Indian context. They say that lack of regulatory mandate to undertake climate risk pricing also hinders them from taking it because there's no mandate and it's in the competitive environment. If they price it better, uh, price it higher, there might not be takers in the Indian environment. So they really need to have some sort of mandate or some sort of constraints, uh, you know, ma um, uh, measurements to ensure that they take it and the people are also not, uh, the competition is also not cutting them down. And they say that even if we do all of this, they see that India is uh, a little uh, far from the process and it will take another three, four years for them to develop and consider climate risk mainstream strategies. Why so? We will hear from some of the panelists today. Uh, from the insurance agency side, we understand that global insurance agencies do consider climate risk, but the Indian insurance agencies do not have in-house expertise or do not undertaking those conscious efforts to have matrices and segments to um, measure climate risk in their considerations of climate portfolio, uh, don't have climate risk management uh, portfolio in their, uh, in their portfolio. 
and they also have lack of technical data and poor awareness among institutions even the investing companies or the financial institutions are not demanding that you know they should be undertaking climate risk insurance climate risk pricing considerations and that's why they are also not doing it because it comes with a certain cost someone has to bear that cost and if no one is willing to bear that cost then obviously it's difficult to have that place in the initial context also if you talk about ecosystem enablers they are focusing to get more data on weather over climate risk so there's weather predictions are there in india a lot in terms of the rains in terms of uh, you know the precipitation but not uh, for others uh, so there is a need to have a cognizant uh, that the other climate risk also need to be measured there's a recent wave on collecting climate impact data yes there are some institutions some organizations who are doing it region wise pin code wise and trying to establish data but again it will take 2 to 3 years before the data uh, get can can get collected and then we will be able to ensure that the pricing mechanisms could be developed uh, i think the toby uh, the other one of the panelists can talk about how data can be more useful for us to collect and then analyze the, to ensure climate risk pricing and there's a need for greater engagement of customers financiers to come together and develop the solutions together uh, which are acceptable to the market and everybody can deploy so what some of the recommendations that we provided by again the recommendations that come from the stakeholders is that we need to learn from the global counterparts if 800 more than 800 financial institutions are coming forward and disclosing the climate risk and considering climate risk pricing mechanisms in their portfolio as part of tcfd that indian institution should also be more uh, forthcoming and be part of this they need to have the specific teams to collect and report data they need to encourage the investing companies to collect that data and report the you know it on a periodic basis in terms of what are the climate risks that they have faced what are some of the portfolios uh, impact that they have faced due to climate change or climate risk in, uh, you know considerations uh, they need to ensure the involvement of senior management in climate related financial disclosures because senior management needs to be cognizant of the fact that the climate risk is impact in their portfolio and they can take a conscious decision of including climate risk assessment in their assess uh, in their credit assessments in their financing assessments uh with the financial uh, with the insurance agencies we understand that the insurance agencies need to share knowledge on climate risk mainstreaming with the financing sector they need to be more cognizant of the fact that how the global counterparts are doing it and how they can support in you know uh, ensuring that the information is disseminated uh, at, at adequate level they need to have active collaboration and advance analytics so insurance agencies can actually because they are more risk uh, at the more risk zone because they they have to reimburse the you know the the repayments so they can involved in corporate and advanced analytics and consider climate risks in their consideration and while calculating the premium and other considerations uh the government also needs to play a strong role here uh, uh, in terms of you know they need to prepare a strategic plan to encourage all the stakeholders including financial institutions banks and others to you know uh, consider climate risks they need to endorse principles on tcfd if they endorse it and they also be part of it they will be able to ensure that the financial institutions also understand the impact, impact of it the benefit of it and can start considering it and they need to have uh, systems processes to collect the data they need to support the data like they are doing for census like they are doing for other mechanisms they should also collect data on climate risk and keep publishing it on a regular basis to make people aware about it and you know so that some sort of mechanisms can be developed on that at the end there is a main major role which need to be played by the enterprises as well they need to Uh, support in data collection they need to do more research probably with the support of shakti foundation organizations like us can do more research as an ecosystem enablers to ensure that the climate risk pricing mechanisms are more talked about people get understanding about what is it why it is important why it should be done and we can also do conduct capacity building programs of the government financial institutions and other stakeholders for mainstreaming climate risk models in india in the end i just want to leave you with a journey map that you know it is important if we want to undertake climate risk pricing if we want to understand the impact of climate risk we need to identify the climate change asset risks on the assets that what are the risks that the assets or your portfolio is facing you need to collect that data out in terms of how it is impacting where it is impacting are there regional uh, correlations are there portfolio correlations in any way so that you understand more about it you need to involve your board and management to take conscious decisions that you really want to do this and you really want to uh, you know ensure that the processes are setting to collect the data to report the data to analyze the data and to price the data as well you need to describe the processes 
but even after you do everything you really need to disclose it to all the organizations and you also be forthcoming if you are doing something you should be forthcoming and sharing your in discussions and your findings with all the financial institutions community and you know you have to have more strategies involving all the stakeholders together so if the institutional investors if the banks come together and have a joint program it will be much more beneficial for all of us so if we start doing it we should be more open about it and cross sharing learnings will definitely help all of us in ensuring that the climate risk pricing is considered and taken care by uh, you know considered in the portfolio or the impact assessment uh, investment uh, by the indian institutions i wanted to quickly summarize it and uh, leave it uh, and pass on the baton to santosh uh, uh, who is also the moderator of the panel today he is a director energy climate change and agriculture practice at intelica and uh, santosh you can take it forward from here uh, for the panel discussion thank you ankit so before i kind of uh, you know go into the panel discussion i think uh, i just want to thank everyone who had joined and and uh, uh, my panelists for whom i'm going to introduce soon but we have panelists joining from multiple time zones and uh, uh, i will big thank you for making it possible because we were struggling to find the right time to have everyone together uh, but just a couple of pointers uh, on the uh, study that we have done and and for the larger audience while uh, we have been talking about climate risk and 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 a number of things that uh, ankit pointed out that how financial institutions in india have uh, been kind of not that much advanced on the path uh, when pusta and i discussed this study we were hoping to find out uh, how indian institutions are pricing climate risk to our surprise we came to know that there are not many who are even kind of trying to understand climate risk uh, not disclosing not even segregating the portfolio so uh the pricing comes as a third or fourth step into the climate risk mainstreaming so it was a good learning for us that the indian space is kind of uh, uh just starting on the climate risk factoring in the two point i want to highlight uh we have talked a lot about the climate risk and in in terms of quantification of climate risk for those who are looking to see how big is the climate risk uh the climate risk typically Uh, you know we did a study uh, you know there are a number of studies done but one study that i want to quote which uh, was done by unep is that uh, 13% of the portfolio of the large 500 investor is at risk and we are only talking about the 500 uh, investors if you put that it could be more because those investors might have a more uh, risk uh, mitigating measures applied already so 13% of their portfolio is at risk which roughly turn out to be around 10.7 trillion dollars if you look at their total worth of around 18 uh, 81.2 trillion that they manage but it's not only about the risk there is an opportunity as well the way you are going to handle climate risk is going to throw up an opportunity of something in the range of 2.1 trillion dollar annually because when you transition to uh, you know the low carbon scenarios and you have those factors in this puts a big big opportunity so so it's not only about kind of risk but it also about the opportunity that is uh, uh, going to emerge because of factoring in uh, climate risk in your investment decisions so that's point one um, and and the second point i want to make is that uh, the climate risk factoring in it happens multiple level uh, the last year at the portfolio level and then I, i would see that if we can get some discussion on that but just to give you this context and i'm going to quickly introduce the panel that i have and and take you through the panel discussion uh for the audience this all sessions are uh, live on zoom as well as uh, we are draw, you know kind of main uh, live streaming it on uh facebook and it would be put on youtube i think after a couple of days ankit we would be on the we'll youtube as well so you can yeah yeah we'll yeah. share with everyone the link uh, of the panel session yeah so uh so just quickly i want to kind of take you through the panel and then uh, so my first panelist is uh, ms anubha prasad uh, she is the national coordinator for the partnership for action on green economy uh, uh, with unep and and is a uh, she is managing the partnership which is between unep unido uh, ilo and unitar and uh, she has been steering various projects of unep in india including sustainable finance green livelihood green intervention uh, at indian rail and uh, a number of others so uh, she would be the one first to go and provide her initial remark about how climate risk relate to the work she is doing at unep and what is her perspective and what she sees 
uh, as a roadmap for financial institution in India to factor in climate risk in their uh, operation and their portfolio. So uh, over to you, Anuva. Anuva, can you, I think you are on a mute. Can somebody unmute Anuva? I think, who is the, okay, just try. Okay. I think it's fine now. Yeah, it's working. All technical Sorry, glitches, last minute technical glitches. So for the most of the time, I would be not available on video because my connection is being unstable as I can see. Um, thanks very much, Shakti in Telecap, uh, Avishkar and Sankalp Forum for having me. As Santosh introduced me, I work for the UNEP, but I also have a long experience in one of the premier financial institutions of India. I worked for SIDBI for uh, about 23 years plus. So, and I was heading the sustainability vertical there. So that experience is there. And um, I'm very happy to see this discourse happening here. And especially with the profile of the audience also, because I'm seeing from uh, across different kind of, uh, you know, verticals, People are there. So I'm just going to stop my video. Uh, as Vikas said, there is no point preaching to the converts. So uh, this August audience realizes very well that climate change has become a defining challenge of the 21st century. And the consensus is growing that it will be at best costly for the economy and at worst disastrous for the human society. However, in India, uh, we are still in an era where sustainable finance is evolving. And the pace has, of course, accelerated over the past decade because of some voluntary market-led initiatives as well as some policy actions. So there was this uh, launch of national voluntary guidelines by IBA. Um, there was uh, this uh, RBI included uh, renewable energy requirements uh, for the green bond market. Then there was rollout of BSE indices, SNP, BSC Green X, and SNP, BSC Carbon X. Government of India has had a strong policy push for sustainability aligned sectors. Of course, there has been some kind of deprioritization of late because of the COVID crisis. And we have this National Clean Energy Fund. So these are some of the things that set the context for today's discussion. Um, we all know that we recently had Asia's largest solar power plant coming up at Riva, Madhya Pradesh, and we are the second largest green bond market amongst the emerging economies. So, um, and we are part of EU's action plan on sustainable finance, and we are well poised to work on uh, development of a national sustainable finance policy framework. So uh, going forward, the availability of adequate finance, the active participation of the private sector, the incorporation of uh, sustainability concerns by corporations and investees, which goes beyond the usual ESG framework that we always talk about, and to create risk measurement and mitigation frameworks and making a business case for financing for sustainability and factoring these risks into your investment decisions. These are our imperatives to achieve our environmental commitments and also to mitigate, avoid, and adapt to the essential climate risks that we are facing. So on uh, UNEP side, we have an um, India Advisory Con Council, which was uh, convened by FIKI. So it has a report which, was, which came out in 2016, and it talks about delivering a sustainable financial system in India. It calls for a robust and resilient sustainability-oriented market framework. So this is some of our work, which is uh, on the uh, sustainable finance side. And uh, it also talks about uh, incentives such as uh, tax incentives, strengthening of existing institutions such as IREDA who, who have the potential to become the green development financing institution and deregulations to increase the ECB fundings of green projects, inclusion of renewable energy within the priority sector lending, etc. etc. So these were some of the recommendations that came out of the U UNEP finance inquiry and FIKI report. UNEP is also closely working with GEF, the Global Environmental Facility, on the project for aligning the financial system and infrastructure investments with sustainable development. So uh, we talk about three-pronged strategies of catalyzing national action, uh, building international consensus around best practices, and to promote large-scale and potentially transformational sustainable infrastructure investments. 
So um, this uh, task force on climate related financial disclosures that we've been discussing over here. So the basis is that the climate risk cannot be ignored because it threatens the financial stabilities and returns over a longish period of time. So any responsible investor who has a goal to make informed investment decisions, he, he or she has to factor in the climate concerns or the risks and the mitigants. So anything which we talk about mitigating should start with a measurement framework. So uh, there is the further work is on integration of climate related risk matrices into our investment process and reporting documents. So this, is, uh, this actually aims to price the climate risk and to reward innovation and to provide the right kind of information to the investors. So we all know that uh, we are talking about uh, the physical risks and the transition risks over here. Uh, however, in India, uh, we haven't proceeded uh, from a framework which talks about only the disaster related framework. So we have different kinds of insurance schemes which talk about disasters and the short term relief from the disasters. So uh, we definitely talk about the extreme weather events, but we don't talk about the long-term climate changes which are resulting in severe repercussions for livelihoods. So um, I was going through this report by SEVA on uh, their climate risk mitigation strategy. SEVA is the Self-Employed Women's Association and they are doing very good work among the women workers in um, several states of India. So it talks about uh, you know, the shrinkage of the fishing season among the fishermen because of the climate concerns and disappearance of certain bi biodiversity because of the climate change and uh, you know, the rise in the temperatures. So uh, once the fishing season is, shrink is shrunk, then of course the returns of the fishermen and their income is hurt. Similarly, all long-term investments are kind of subject to these kind of risks. So, uh, and on the transitional uh, side, of course, we have uh, emerging climate policy and low carbon technologies, which can have, uh, which can have uh, adverse impacts on the financial performance, at least in the short run. So, uh, the recommendations of the TCFD outline the need for corporate and financial institutions to conduct forward looking scenario based assessment. So, there are several kinds of scenario-based um, investment uh, assessments in the, in the TCFD document about the climate-related risks and opportunities. So the problem in India is, um, see, we don't have, uh, we don't see much appetite here. We don't have the relevant data sets and we don't have the skills for cl climate risk pricing. So uh, having worked in a financial institution, I've seen that we do factor in environmental risks in our, uh, you know, pricing decisions and even risk rating decisions, um, but then we are totally uh, lost when it comes to the long-term climate risk. So the, even the, the measurement does not exist, the uh, factoring in, in the risk rating framework that does not exist, and of course that does not translate into a pricing framework. So um, we at UNEP, since we have a lot of deep diving work in uh, climate risk mitigation, disclosures, and the TCFD work of course, so we are, we will be too willing to partner with uh, financial institutions and institutional investors to transmit these best practices to reflect in climate risk mitigation and pricing strategies. Thanks a lot. That's all from me. Thank you, Anwar. I think uh, you set a good context because, uh, you know, when we were doing the study, what came out was that uh, it was not that there was a lack of willingness, but there was a not so much clarity about how to move from one step to another. And also if people knew that they have the climate risk, they were not very sure what to do next. So, so that would be very, very uh, relevant to have best practices and institutions like UNEP uh, come and steer this uh, whole discourse. Um, moving on to my next panelist, uh, Mangesh. Uh, Mangesh uh, heads the local agriculture underwriting team at India branch of Swissri. Uh, he's based in Mumbai and he's responsible for managing the Indian agriculture business. And prior to this, Mangesh served as, uh, as an underwriter in agriculture team in Singapore, where he worked on structuring, pricing, and underwriting crop and livestock insurance product for uh, Susri. Uh, Mangesh, uh, in your initial remark, if you can uh, focus on a few things, uh, you know, uh, which can provide more of the context from a climate uh, risk being seen in the insurance and the kind of uh, sectors that you work in. Uh, Swissy has one you know, of the key players. So 
what is Swiss Re's experience in climate risk impact and reincidence of the product. Uh, you can also talk about some of the uh, sectoral challenges and the guiding principle that you have. So over to you, Mangesh. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, first of all, uh, to all the organizers uh, for providing a platform to share thoughts on this vast and uh, very relevant uh, uh, topic uh, for the day. Uh, frankly, as we study more, uh, we get overwhelmed with the complexities related to climate change. Uh, let's first uh, try to demarcate uh, the weather issues from uh, climate climate issues. I think there is often some confusion around uh, these topics. When we talk about agriculture, let's say, uh, we typically focus on uh, weather volatilities. Uh, for example, a drought or a sudden rain. But when we talk about climate change impact on uh, agro, in very simple terms, very layman terms, we need to typically look into rising frequency of droughts or uh, rising cases of uh, extreme rains. And unfortunately, it's very tough to sort of demarcate uh, what we are covering when we cover crop insurance because climate issues are much slower in nature. So whether a particular damage has happened really uh, due to weather issue or climate issue, that's really the golden question. Uh, we are finding it, uh, finding it quite evident that there are a lot of losses lately uh, coming from so-called secondary perils, uh, most of them which uh, have like direct links uh, to climate change. Um, an example would be uh, uh, too much of rainfall or flood uh, in Japan, um, bushfires, wildfires in uh, US and uh, Australia. Uh, if we uh, talk about local examples, that would be a delayed rainfall uh, inception uh, particularly in the northern states uh, of Bihar, uh, Jharkhand, uh, increasingly uh, difficult floods uh, for Kerala. And another example that uh, I think Pustav mentioned uh, is the unusual locust attack that uh, we are seeing, which is very closely linked with uh, the disturbed uh, rainy season. And the industry in, in general tends to uh, be paying uh, more and more uh, payouts uh, due to these uh, factors. More importantly, we uh, observe climate change uh, uh, impacting so much that it's leaving actually some of the risks in a way uninsurable or unaffordable. And in these cases, the state uh, or the government has to step in. Uh, an example would be a flood re uh, in UK, which allows highly exposed um, flood risks uh, to still be insured through a public-private partnership arrangement. And uh, another example uh, where the state has to step in uh, to make things a bit affordable is really the Indian example of uh, crop insurance scheme where uh, it's a highly subsidized product. The subsidies are shared by the central government and the state government equally to ease out um, the premium burden on the farmers. Um, thirdly, we can see actually more uh, pronounced uh, climate risk through our own research as well. So Swiss Re itself has uh, something called Swiss Re Institute, which has studied the uh, impact since uh, 90s. Um, it's very evident that uh, ENSO does impact particularly in India on uh, uh, agriculture. We have seen commonly, not every time, but commonly that uh, El Nino year uh, means usually a drought year. And I would say this is the most important climate induced risk for um, agro India, the ENSO effect. As far as uh, the insurance or reinsurance industry uh, response uh, framework is concerned, I'll just uh, take an example of uh, uh, Swiss Re itself. Swiss Re has a detailed uh, sustainability uh, strategy, which serves as our framework of, for covering different sectors. It's a sort of proactive approach where we tend to refuse to cover certain risks where the subject matter is seen to be uh, contributing to negative climate change. Uh, an example would be a few palm plantations in uh, Indonesia, which are established on deforested land. Uh, apart from that, we have our own analytics team as well working on um, natural catastrophe models. Uh, we have developed our own climate uh, risk score framework this framework basically combines our exposure data with uh, 
the physical uh, uh, climate model data, um, our uh, internal NatCat modeling uh, know-how and uh, sustainability indicators. And uh, we basically classify this whole stuff in uh, two metrics. Uh, one is the portfolio's physical exposure uh, to the climate change, uh, which is more like the exposure score. The second is portfolio's qualitative sustainability uh, composition, the one that I mentioned about Indonesian uh, uh, palm plantations in some cases. So that's the sustainability score. The climate related disclosures, uh, disclosures are definitely becoming more and more uh, essential for uh, investors uh, as well as the regulators. And uh, this sort of scoring uh, definitely provides the first step towards uh, sort of quantification of uh, climate related risks. Um, we recognize, of course, the challenge that climate change uh, poses. We have uh, signed up uh, to the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, and we have committed to reducing our own carbon uh, emission to net zero by 2050. Uh, I agree with uh, Ankit's comment that uh, we definitely need more and more uh, research and more participation from general public, as well as other industry uh, stakeholders. Uh, like uh, risk modeling agencies with whom we work very closely. A lot of other insurers and reinsurers also work. Uh, Swissery does its own bit in this regard as well and has a reporting tool called uh, Sigma, um, which is publicly available. Uh, it's fairly interactive. It gives a good uh, idea about the global losses that have happened due to various natural catastrophes. But uh, in general, I agree that more collaboration uh, is needed more climate education is needed, climate change education is needed to reduce the protection gap which is uh, posed by this uh, issue. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mangesh. I have a couple of uh, follow-up questions which I will come uh, after all the panels have spoken, but glad to know that uh, Swissery is doing almost every piece of climate risk mainstreaming. You have your framework, you have the models, you are already kind of uh, uh, factoring those in and you have a commitment as well. So this would be a good way to kind of showcase how other agencies, uh, be it in the insurance business or uh, somewhere uh, in a other business stage can factor in. Also, I love the uh, a kind of uh, the insight that you gave is that the climate risk insurance is not going to be affordable for many because of the inherent pricing that we are looking at. So uh, throws another challenge that even if there's a climate risk insurance product, who is going to buy for that? Is it a job of a common uh, institution or uh, uh, is some kind of government intervention is uh, needed? Uh, but I'll come back to those uh, uh, post the initial round of discussions uh, uh, from our other panelists. So my next uh, panelist is Mr. Sanjay uh, Agrawal. Uh, Sanjay Agrawal is a senior director in care ratings. He currently leads the BFSI practice of care ratings and uh, Sanjay had been in care ratings since 2010 and has been associated with case, uh, care risk management, relationship development in various corporate initiatives. Uh, prior to this, Sanjay was uh, DGM in ICIC Bank and he was part of the global risk management group of uh, ICIC Bank. So uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Sanjay and, and a couple of uh, pointers for his initial remark that I had was, you know, one word that I heard from Swissery that how Swissery is handling climate risk in their operations and in their product offering. Uh, if uh, Mr. Grewal can also talk about care, uh, you know, factoring in those climate risks in their existing matrices or they have a plan for that. And how care ratings is kind of seeing the climate risk panning out in uh, the different institutions that they rate and whether they have a you know, particular approach or uh, a particular kind of framework that they are either adopting or they want to adopt. And, and uh, the, these two points would give me kind of a good understanding that how the rating agencies are looking at that. So not only concerned with the rating agency like care itself, but also if you can talk about the larger rating agencies take on climate uh, risk, that would be very helpful. So what do you, Mr. Sanjay? Thank you, Santosh. Uh, yeah, what, um, I, as you mentioned, I would be speaking more about the rating industry as a whole rather than, uh, let's say, care rating and what care rating does. So in terms of factoring the climate risk, now climate risk generally works on a long time horizon of, say, a decade or so. And when you do any risk analysis, when you intend to forecast or incorporate uh, impact of risk, which materializes over a, say, a long period of time, the risk underplays because the later period is heavily discounted on time series. The longer the time frame, uh, the analysis becomes uh, 
more difficult to undertake because then there are multiple factors at play, current and evolving, whose impact and counter impact would play out over a period of time. So I mean, it's difficult to understand what will be the full, uh, let's say, impact of that leg. Let's say just now, Swiss Re said that uh, climate risk insurance would be very difficult to get. So, so those are the various things uh, which are there. Now, when we are doing credit rating, our prognosis on the quantitative model is limited to a period of say two, three times because that is the period you can uh, realistically forecast, which again is difficult in these days, but still that is the period till which you can forecast. Beyond that, you have to look at the qualitative factors, that's the management, the industry, the overall government policies, they become more important. Therefore, in a current models, we don't factor in climate risk very explicitly. Now, having said that, the climate risk does play out a, I mean, in the way the analysis carried out and the need to put factor in the sustainability angle. So if all other parameters remain the same, an industry with less carbon consumption is likely to get a better rating than an industry which say, needs more carbon. So recycling companies, let's say, subject to technology, size, organization or management capabilities are likely to get a higher rating than a similar unit producing virgin products. Or if you see the difference in the solar genco's and the thermal genco's, you'll see there is a subtle difference, which arises out of there being on the right side of the climate risk uh, participation. Now, credit risk is a tool for assessing default risk on a relative basis. So a uh, single A default uh, is likely to be lower than a triple B default, but is likely to be higher than a double A in default. And any credit rating incrementally takes into account newer information and facts and undertakes the changes in the rating as they arise. So with society, government taking steps towards climate risk and the policy framework being attuned to that, like let's say the solar renewable obligation of the ERC, et cetera, these features are incorporated and the rating then reflects these realities. So, so that is how we factor in the climate uh, climate risk uh, probably slightly implicitly rather than an explicit feature of it being in the models. So, so what, I have a follow-up question if you can answer that uh, immediately because uh, you know in the credit rating models, there is a lot of focus on which variable to be incorporated and, and unless and until that variable becomes so strong and so predictive uh, that you can't avoid, uh, chances are that many variables would remain kind of uh, hidden. Uh, one of the questions that I had was that how, if, if we talk about the data that has been collected by different kind of uh, sources, is there a way that you see the data collection mechanism, the kind of data that you collect about the asset is changing, and that is incorporating what variables? Because whether it is data we have so far kind of, uh, the flood is one variable that has found the presence in most of the created models. But whether we are started to kind of factor in the temperature change or, or other variables uh, at the time of data collection. I'm not talking about whether, you know, uh, for example, a real estate losing the valuation might be a result of increased flood intensity in that area. Uh, but if we are not capturing that in, uh, it might be very difficult for us to say that whether uh, that goes into our uh, models. So do you want to kind of highlight how a new variable goes into the great ratings um, uh, toolkit? So yeah, I mean, uh, we do a review of the ratings uh, at least once a year and uh, more than a year. And as data keeps getting uh, available to us and as new situations develop or you have a better perspective on many things, uh, you keep uh, you know, including that in the rating uh, models and in the uh, rating discussion. So in your example, let's say an uh, area which is relatively safer and now because of the climate risk, uh, uh, event happening now the flood uh, intensity has increased so that is one uh, thing you'll certainly discuss with the company and uh, see how it is impacting the business of the company and what is happening to the revenues and so the uh, so what is happening to the uh, rating of the company so so these variables are there but uh, on the larger side see what happens is most of the companies which come for rating are the larger companies and they also keep taking their own initiatives and action to counter whatever changes which happen. So there's a lot of, uh, as I said earlier, there's a lot of uh, impact, counter impact, uh, which keeps going in the analysis to be able to factor in the actual uh, rating at the end. Okay, we'll, we'll continue a few of more questions on the uh, rating agency. Uh, but for the audience, please put the questions uh, in the chat box and we will take it up post this uh, initial remarks and in the uh, Q&A sessions. 
So Sanjay, thank you for uh, your remark. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we see that uh, rating, uh, ratings are also kind of reflection of what's going on in the, uh, in the financial sector and whether a variable becomes very strong that you need to start uh, factoring in. So as you said, that's a chicken and egg situation earlier. So we have to wait for uh, you know, somebody to kind of make this equation work. Uh, but moving on to uh, my next panelist, uh, uh, Toby from Global Parametrics. Uh, Toby, uh, you know, had more than 20 years of experience in this sector, uh, and then he he works in deploying financial solution in emerging economies. Uh, he's based out of London, and uh, uh, Toby also did a master class on um, climate risk pricing at Sankalp uh, last year. Uh, and uh, prior to Global Matrix, he had, uh, you know, worked with AIG and number of other insurance agencies. So he brings a lot of understanding of emerging markets, the climate risk, and how they are being dealt with. Uh, and then probably Global Mat uh, Parametrics is also one of the leaders in new product offering for MFI sector, uh, uh, which are factoring in, you know, uh, climate risk and some parametric products. So uh, Toby, over to you, you know, for initial remarks, and I think a couple of questions that I want you to kind of uh, uh, highlight is that, uh, you know, A, your own take on how climate risk models and, uh, you know, uh, risks are panning out in different sectors and, and how accurate they are going. And once we have understood that the risk is there and we have quantified that, what would be the roadmap for that institution? Because one of the key things is that if we have the risk identified and if you are not sure how to price it, how to act on that, then the whole exercise becomes uh, you know, kind of uh, useless. So over to you. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here on the panel. Um, and I was just thinking, you know, as I said, last time we, we met, we were in Mumbai and how, how different things are. Um, and, it, and that sort of brings you back to this understanding of, you know, if you don't understand a risk or if you haven't thought about it, um, you're, it's, it's one side. But once you do understand the risk, then how do you, what do you do with that, with that action? Um, and global parametrics was sort of set up to first to enable the sort of the understanding of, of cl both climate and weather risks. And I think it was a very strong point but that there is actually a big difference between weather, which is sort of something which, in, which is happening, you know, which affects you now, and um, climate, which is the incidence of how, how often it happens. And this, you know, climate change is happening all over the world and we're seeing very strongly um, in India as well. So the question becomes, what do you need to do? And how do you um, assess that risk and how do you create a single identif identifiable form that you can actually look at the risk and say, this is bad or this is, this is good, this is at, at a different level, and have a value which is sort of transparent so that everyone can see it and everyone has that single view from right to the bottom to the sort of, you know, an individual client of a company to all the way up to the top of the government. Once you have that sort of single form, what we call parametrics or a parametric index, then it enables people to make decisions off that. Then you become, have something which is decisionable. And at G GP, we were sort of set up with funding from both the British and German governments to form those sort of global standardized indexes for as many um, weather perils as, as possible, um, primarily ones in countries where there wasn't much data and primarily in countries where they hadn't really thought about these issues before. So by having the information, it now enables you to start sort of thinking, thinking forward. When we talk about um, organizations that we work with, and I think it fits very, very well with what we're talking about here, it's organizations which have portfolios at risk um, from, from weather um, and from the weather effects caused by climate change. And these organizations can be, as we saw, sort of microfinance institutions, so, so lenders. Um, and, and they can have, you know, portfolios at risk, people can't, re two things. One, a weather incident causes people not being able to repay back their loans, so that affects their business. But if they're thinking about climate and the long-term effects, it's where they should lend into. Um, or maybe when they talk to their clients, they should tell them, um, to lend, to maybe do a different crop if they're, a, um, they're lending to sort of agricultural, or to sort of talk about if they're lending to some more of the urban places, um, where they should build their build it, businesses, what businesses people should run. So it enables you to have that sort of short term, protect yourself, um, and then the long term view of how you should sort of build your strategy. And we mentioned here that we were talking about sort of a lot of this stuff is about rural, rural insurance, agricultural, and the big programs. Um, that we were mentioning earlier, um, the governmental ones for India, mainly focus on the farmers. But there's a huge problem now with um, urban climate resilience, you know, heat. Uh, if people can't go outside because it's too hot and they're doing sort of low level, low level businesses and they can't work. If people's place of work is their homes and it becomes too hot to work there, what do they do? So there's this huge um, urban problem, which is now people are starting, starting to think about. 
and at GP we've sort of working with some housing trusts in India to sort of start thinking about how that how that works. The next side of it is once you understand your risk and you say okay um, I know I'm either the risk of something bad to happen whether it's a flood or whether it's a, a heat wave in this area or whether I know that in the future things are going to get worse what do you do with that? What, you, so you have an information how do you make that actionable? And we call this um, anticipatory finance. It's an idea that an institution can actually anticipate where they, um, what's going to happen and what finance they need to have in place for when it does happen. So for example, um, if we're talking about an investor, an investor can say, I have a portfolio of investments which are very exposed at the moment to, to, to tropical cyclones. Um, so what I can do is I can anticipate it by either not investing there, I can build up reserves so that I know that if something goes on, I can keep my, I can keep my business going. I can actually invest in that area knowing that other people won't. Um, so it's on that side. And equally, I can think about hedging my risk or buying an insurance or reinsurance or, or getting credit um, in, face, in, in, in case that, that happens. So you basically have a way of protecting your business, but also, um, as we were talking about before, there are ways that you can have advantage of this. If you understand your, your risk to, to weather, to climate, to natural disasters, better than anyone else, you can start moving into areas where, where, others, where there are others aren't. You can start helping the, people, the companies you invest into and in saying, this is not where you should build a wind farm, or this is not where you should be building your dam. We should be thinking about in, in different, different areas, areas of that. So that's what sort of how we, the sort of conversations that we have with investors and financial institutions. Um, how in globally, how are, we, how are we seeing this? Well, big global investors like BlackRock are saying that unless the people they invest in are taking climate risks seriously, they're not going to invest in them. Um, you have the big the developmental financial institutions who are take, thinking along the same lines, and some of them are even thinking about putting in sort of climate risk products into their into their lending. So they'll lend, but as, as part of that, there's a um, they pay a little bit of extra money so that if there is a, a flood or if there is a, a tropical cyclone or a heat wave which stops the company they've lent to carrying on their businesses, they can keep paying they can keep paying back the, the loans. So you're seeing that on both on the commercial side and you're seeing it on the developmental finance side of it. Um, and in India, so as we were talking about before, there has been a, a, sort of a reticence um, in, in the past and that there are other issues to think about and so who, who, should, who should pay? Should the investor pay? Should the investee pay? Should the investee's client pay? Um, and you know, as, as, it, as the payment falls down the chain, it becomes much more expensive. And that's why we're having sort of conversations now about these ideas of, of building facilities or risk pooling, whereby different organizations can all pool their risk together, um, thereby reducing the amount of, of, of overall risk and um, increasing the sort of the size of the portfolios, which then enables the price to come down. So those are sort of discussions that we've been having with partners in India. Santosh, you're, you're, you're on mute. Just, sorry, um, I did not realize. So Toby, I think the point you were saying about, uh, you know, what to do when you identify the climate risk, what are the next steps and how we can, you know, uh, uh, factor that in into our decision sort of strategy. Uh, uh, and I, I, I have some follow up questions and the questions are coming. So we'll come back to that uh, to know more about that, because I would ask you to provide some examples where uh, you, you know, kind of get the financial institution on board to avail these kind of offering that you have. So I want to know the discuss and how the discussion panned out because uh, it's an emerging area and somebody to sign the dotted line, it requires a fair bit of uh, persuasion. But I think I'm moving on to my uh, last but not the least panelist, uh, Vijay, and I think uh, I'm so grateful for you, uh, you know, uh, joining here because uh, Vijay is based out of DC. So let me just quickly introduce and uh, uh, Vijay had been a great friend of the group and we have been working together. Vijay has more than 20 years of uh, experience working in access to finance uh, and uh, he's part of the World Bank Group. He is a senior operations officer uh, with IFC based out of DC. He had been looking at uh, agriculture uh, risk and insurance and a number of other programs. So Vijay, if you can uh, switch on your camera and uh, 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 we can see you and uh, if you can give us your initial thought on a couple of questions that we had shared with you. And one was that how IFC, IFC being a big, big player in development finance uh, world, how IFC is factoring in climate risk when you are undertaking uh, uh, investment decisions. 
and and is there a framework in making or a framework that already exists that you use and and whether these frameworks differ from location to location like you know you have a separate framework for a different location and uh, or a different global framework or different indian framework uh, a different framework when you invest in india and uh, what is your take on indian financial institutions readiness for this kind of discourse there is a three point that i want you to kind of highlight in over to you vijay thanks a lot santosh uh, thank you very much and thanks uh, to uh, intellicap and uh, shakti uh, sustainable energy foundation for giving us uh, the opportunity uh, to to share some of our perspectives and uh, let me be upfront and candid i'm not sure if i would be uh, santosh that i would be able to respond to all the three uh, questions that you put forward uh, because uh, uh, i think these are something more uh, institutionally driven as well in some of those areas so let me see how i can basically uh, answer in in a little bit more broader context uh, number one i think for us as an institution the world bank group as an institution i think climate change and the impacts of climate change is uh, is very critical and central to our agenda okay and this is reflected in a couple of ways Uh, for instance if you look at it uh, as an institution as a world bank group as an institution including the world bank and ifc and others uh, that uh, we have something that we track and monitor something called as a climate co benefits yeah so every single uh, lending and investment operation that the world bank group does whether it is on the world bank side whether it is on the ifc side we are supposed to capture and reflect what is the climate co benefits that our investment is going to be contributing towards and that's uh, and for which there is a standard methodology and an approach that has been developed and adopted at a corporate level and this number basically gets reflected at a corporate level so that is something that we have to basically capture and reflect as an institution for every single operation that we do whether it is lending to irrigation systems whether it is lending to financial intermediation purposes whether it is lending to the health sector whether it is lending to the education sector or whatever given area that we have to capture that particular piece of information and needs to be reflected number 1 number 2 is as an institution as a corporate level as a world bank group as an institution we had made a commitment to our shareholders to make sure that uh, we increase our lending to more climate related share of lending continues to increase our target was by 2020 that we achieve 28% of our lending is more climate related and all those things which we have exceeded we have actually crossed more than 30% by 2019 itself though this is supposed to be achieved by 2020 we have crossed our sort of a targets and currently 30% of our lending that we do as an institution is basically climate related when we say we do it we also then you know when we report it we also have to make sure that the clients to whom we are working with whether it is private sector whether it is the government or public sector that we are able to capture those information and then uh, sort of reflect it in our own report card for monitoring purposes so there is a, a methodology there is an approach that we have in place and which and even for ifc we have a complete methodology that has been developed and is something that we basically use that methodology for any given sector that we probably would be supporting whether it is through the financial institution whether it is investment in agri businesses whether it is in investment in health sector there is a methodology that we would basically adopt uh also the same uh, the same bread i also want to highlight that uh, we have also made a commitment that by 2030 by 2030 uh, ifc by sorry by 2025 ifc would be uh, sorry the world bank group would be investing and mobilizing uh, close to about 200 billion dollars to basically support climate related investments yeah by 2021 between 21 and 25 uh, as a world bank group as an institution we would be mobilizing 200 billion dollars to invest and support climate related investment so this is something you know uh, core and central to what we do and and hence we need to have a process a methodology in place which is 
uh, in our case, both in the case of IFC as well as uh, the larger World Bank group, these methodologies have been developed, discussed, approved by the respective boards of IFC as well as the World Bank. And that is what we basically use in terms of monitoring, tracking and reporting purposes. So that's the first uh, point. The second one is that what are the challenges, you know, when we basically look at the financial institutions, you know, what do we basically see? And this is, uh, you know, as I think uh, uh, somebody very rightly said, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Ankit probably said this one in, the, in, in his opening remarks. And also, I think, uh, you know, a few others on the panel have already highlighted this is the question is, are the financial institutions uh, themselves uh, in the Indian context, basically monitoring, tracking, and capturing this information. And that has been the big sort of a gray area or, or a question mark for us, yeah? Uh, to just give you one example is, uh, we wanted to basically get into supporting climate smart agriculture, investments in climate smart agriculture, for example, in the South Asian context, India included. And uh, we wanted to see, uh, take a sense as to what the financial institutions are already doing in this particular space. You know, they are basically categorizing their lending operations uh, and basically capturing such type of information. And uh, the uh, unfortunate reality is today, none of the financial institutions basically capture the information, you know, which basically reflects that a given portfolio of the lending is either climate smart or supporting climate related investment. And I would be surprised, I think uh, uh, that's when we basically went into a couple of financial institutions where we are invested, you know, as IFC, where we are invested, uh, where we basically went in and basically try to work with the financial institution to look at their existing lending portfolios and then be able to identify and basically put a marker on the various uh, asset side of the balance sheet in terms of uh, you know what is that uh, that is basically there which is lent to the climate uh, to support climate related investments yeah uh, so i think that uh, area is today a significant uh, need for support and activism and working with the, the policy makers at the uh, government of india level working with the regulators at the central bank level and working across uh, various, uh, you know, the rating agencies like CARE and others, uh, you know, who are basically there to see how we can basically bring out that information and uh, by the financial institution. That's where I think we would be able to take uh, specific actions. And why is this becoming very, very important and critical as we move forward? And here, this is where I just would like to take the scene. I would like to now change the scene to the global context. Uh, today, if you see, uh, there are about two or three interesting things that are emerging. Number one, if you look at what's happened in the, in, in, in the United States, uh, I think a lot of you would be aware of this company called as uh, PG&E, you know, a large sort of an energy company in, the, in California. Yeah. And uh, this company basically filed for bankruptcy last year in, in California. And why did it file for bankruptcy? A major contributing factor has been the wild, uh, the, the wildfires in California and that PG&E has been blamed as one of these institutions which has contributed to it. Yeah? Because a huge amount of fossil fuel energy generation and, uh, and that it has contributed to this one. Uh, the estimated sort of, a, you know, and, and we all know that there are billions of dollars uh, in terms of damages, and I'm sure that a lot of financial institutions and investors, you know, whether it is in the stock of PG&E or whether it is in the uh, lendings to the PG&E, all of these are completely exposed now, okay, for those, uh, both from an investor standpoint of view and from a lender standpoint of view. That is now what we are also seeing in the United States is Exxon is now again the next one on the block, uh, which is uh, getting there, okay? And the, there is a precedent in the United States. Again, those of you who might have followed, yes, one can say that it is a litigious environment, no doubt, but there is a precedent, precedent in the form of the big tobacco companies who are basically held uh, you know, as contributing to all the health hazards and they finally ended up coughing out $200 billion in terms of damages uh, by all the, uh, you know, sort of a big, big tobacco companies. Now, do we see uh, 
the Minsky uh, moment uh, now coming in terms of these climate change? Probably, okay. Uh, the Minsky moment is, I think it's knocking there and it is uh, primarily going to contribute to some destabilization impact, particularly with financial institutions, which have been exposed to, you know, energy companies, which are the fossil fuel sort of a segment is something I think it's not too far. Now, would India be there? Probably not. Okay. But is this a global thing and it is catching up? We are already seeing it as a global thing. And uh, what we have already seen is several global financial institutions already have made a global commitment of not to fund fossil fuel. And whatever they have in terms of funding to the fossil fuel is going to be wound up. Uh, very clear timelines have been given. So I think there is a very clear telling sort of an impact for those of us, particularly if you're looking at it from an IFC uh, sort of a perspective as well. I think this is something very, very critical uh, for us because we are part of this whole agenda to be very climate responsible and climate responsive. So I think this is something that we're going to be seeing. The other thing that what we are also seeing, and I'm sure that some of you would have seen this global stability, uh, financial stability report coming out from the latest one from IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Yeah. And that again, and there is a chapter very clearly dedicated to the impacts of climate change and what people need to be cognizant about. There are about two or three things that they basically highlight. One is the impact on uh, the stock market returns of, uh, you know, as a result of this climate uh, scenarios. And uh, IMF has done some of these modeling and they've said that, uh, for example, they basically look at what happened in Thai floods, that following the Thai floods of 2011, the equity markets, uh, the returns of the equity markets declined by almost about 40 to 46 percent. Okay, even though it was for a, <clears throat> even though it was for a period of about 40 to 56 days, that certainly has a significant impact for all the financial institutions which are basically exposed. And how is that particular risk being captured? And so from an investor standpoint of view, when a portfolio investor standpoint of view, are they basically factoring some of these effects on, on their basically exposures when they're basically making these types, whether it's from pension fund, whether it is uh, from the financial institutions which are lending, and even for you know, IFC, because most of our lendings are typically you know, with a maturity of around eight to 10 years, maturity in terms of average maturity of eight to 10 years, are we basically, you know, this is something that we uh, keep a very close eye on and basically look at monitoring when we make those type of investment. So these are something very real that is happening. The second element that what we are also seeing is the impact on the sovereign uh, ratings as well. You know, I'm currently working in, uh, I was working in a country called Fiji, one of the Pacific Island countries. And what you do see for the sovereign rating for this country is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the sort of an international agencies are basically uh, put in a, a significant, one of the biggest risks for Fiji as a country is the uh, climate change impact. It is one of the well-managed, fiscally well-managed island countries in the Pacific Islands. And, but then it is one of the significant countries, which is which a country which is exposed significantly to climate, the sovereign risk is significantly exposed to climate risk. Now, do we see that scenario in India? Probably. Are we factoring that? I don't know, okay. Uh, today, if you look at several sub-sovereign debts that are being issued and, and, and states which are basically exposed to climate risk, and for which I'm sure that several of the financial institutions are basically subscribing uh, to some of the debts issued by the sub-sovereigns, are we as financial institutions in India basically factoring in the impact of the climate change related risk on our asset side of the balance sheet? You know, whether and today, if you look up, again, I don't want to be uh, picking on a particular state or something. And there is a southern state which, you know, over the last three years, I have had consistently been hit by climate related disasters, you know. So, you know. And the question is, and then this, uh, these uh, states have to basically step in and bail out and borrow money uh, to basically bail themselves out and bail their people out. And these sovereigns are basically sub-sovereign instruments that are being issued by this, uh, by this particular states are being invested upon by financial institutions and various investors. To what extent are these uh, basically being factored in is something that one needs to keep in mind. So I think uh, what to, to suffice to say that, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, an issue which is basically taking 
a, a very serious and uh, an urgent need. And, and I think, uh, you know, we all know all the more today in the Indian context uh, that a lot of uh, financial institutions are currently sitting on, uh, on uh, debts given to uh, utilities, particularly power utilities, which are not functioning. And a lot of them happen to be on the fossil fuel. Now, what you're seeing on top of that is in India, in a country like India, the renewables have been growing at a much faster pace. The prices of the renewables have been dropping so significantly. And the question is, uh, even those, you know, where the financial institution have already committed to some of these power utilities to do fossil fuel, is that also at now significant risk because of the growth, the transition risk that we're seeing, moving to the low carbon environment of renewable and sustainable energy, that, uh, that this is even further going to basically sort of an increase the deterioration of the quality of the lending that FIs currently have exposures to all this big fossil fuel generating you know, uh, power utilities that is there. So I think these are real risks that are sitting there. And what we saw today, you know, a couple of, you know, six months back in terms of exposures, you know, you, you sneeze and the whole industry uh, basically coughs in terms of what we saw with the NBFCs, what happened when, uh, you know, one institution uh, went, ILFS went uh, belly up and basically created a big churn for all those who had exposure to NBFCs. Do we or can we foresee a similar sort of a thing with uh, financial institutions exposed to fossil fuels in India? And now with renewables coming in and becoming much more cheaper and, uh, and basically more attractive, would whatever the exposures that FIs have lent to the fossil fuel sector is now going to be the next big Minsky moment that we need to be prepared for. So let me stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vijay couple of questions that we have been kind of uh, uh, getting from the audience and a couple of my own questions because, uh, you know, uh, I would start the question answer session with you because uh, you you have made a number of good points and I want to take that forward and then go back to them. one critical thing that you mentioned that there is no disclosure of climate related sectors. Uh, and, and I think unlike many other countries, India does not have a policy where uh, financial disclosures are categorized in relevant sectors like climate relevant sectors. It's just a, a different, uh, you know, way of uh, disclosures. RBI had made some pointers, but it's not yet there. So, so you can't get the climate risk exposure of any financial institution uh, very easily figured out. It's very difficult. And an and institution like IFC, if they have to insist on that scenario is something that is not a mainstream. Uh, the two point that I want to kind of highlight for the audience, uh, uh, what we just said is that a the way IFC is increasing exposure to the climate related sectors, so funding the climate uh, action, I would say climate action, a positive uh, move towards uh, funding climate solution, is also an indication of reducing focus on the other sectors. So again, that you have a transition risk there because the finance is moving away from uh, you know different source. Second, uh, Vijay, you talked about the World Bank group's methodology of assessing an investment, and you have multiple parameters that you guys already look for when you make investment decision. Have you ever thought of, or, or is it a practice that you force those uh, frameworks on the institution that you lend to, or it is just for your own investment? You are on a mute, Vijay. Yeah, Vizier, you are on yeah mute. I'm just, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, it's a process of dialogue, yeah, because what we do provide is uh, we have two pieces. One is the investment piece. One is the advisory piece. So wherever we see a client engagement that happens, okay, and certainly, as I said, very clearly that as an institution for us, we certainly are very sensitive and, and responsible in terms of uh, factoring in the climate change and the risk of climate change and want to basically strengthen our clients with whom we work is also basically moving the same direction. Okay. So we do work with financial, we do work with all our clients, whether it is a financial institution client where we provide a, you know, sort of a financial intermediation type of a lending operation or whether we work with uh, you know, the mainstream, the, the real sector, that uh, 
it is not, we are not trying to collect the data for just for our own internal sort of a consumption and reflecting for our own internal purposes. We also work with our clients to basically build their own internal monitoring systems and framework to capture and basically also able to highlight the economic benefit of basically moving in the direction. So it is not only for us as reporting for reporting purposes uh, that we basically look at it, but equally what is important for us is to make sure that the client is also, you know, the internal capacity, internal systems and way of monitoring and tracking within that particular institution that we work is also strengthened. So that is something that we do provide as part of an advisory support to all our clients, to all our clients, you know, there is nothing that we pick and choose to all our clients. Okay, uh, one very straightforward question uh, from Chandan. Uh, he's asking, do you think financial institutions are not ready to disclose given the climate vulnerability, which may lead to increase in perceived risk and hence impact investment? So uh, this is a point that, uh, you know, uh, I would also touch with, with larger audience. Uh, uh, it, there is a inherent hesitance from the financial institution to showcase their vulnerability because not everyone is doing. So if I showcase, I, I'm seen as more vulnerable, but I might be not as vulnerable as the other guy who has not disclosed. So what's your take on that? He's saying, do you think this is yeah. the reason why institutions are not uh, disclosing? Yeah. See, I think, uh, you know, there certainly there will be some institutions who voluntarily take it up and, uh, and basically disclose it. Uh, I think this has to come, uh, you know, one way to bring it about uh, is by taking this as a policy action. Okay. And this is where, if you look at even in the developed countries, okay, leave alone the developing and emerging markets, okay, in the developed countries for the first time that we saw uh, the stress testing of financial institutions to climate uh, risk uh, only started as a recent phenomenon. Thanks to Mark Carney as uh, the governor of uh, Bank of England, he basically introduced uh, this whole concept of stress testing financial institutions to climate risk, uh, you know, uh, a year or year and a half before he formally stepped down as governor to the Central Bank of England, okay? So that is now basically taken up and, and, and I think somebody did mention uh, this uh, correlation of 60 central banks uh, who have basically come together and uh, are basically now pushing this whole or the network for greening the financial systems uh, which is a coalition of central bank governors and regulators who have come in and basically trying to push this methodology. Even if you look at the United States, I think institutions and large institutions like JP Morgan and others have only recently sort of an acknowledged and have basically started taking this whole thing on board. And from an FI's perspective, I could understand uh, their concern. I think it's not as much about uh, not wanting to report I think it's a question of what is going to be my immediate impact on uh, capital, you know, reserving uh, requirements. Yeah, uh, that is, I think, the immediate because right now a lot of financial institutions had to go through the Basel III uh, sort of an accord and try to address the financial uh, requirements and other stuff. And then on top of that, you know, you're going to be putting in climate stress and uh, do a climate stress and, and basically reflect your capital requirement. It's further adding some burden on the financial institution. So I think if we are going to be engaging in a very open, honest way and, and say that this is going to be a transition pathway and how we are going to be working with you collectively as a financial institution, I am pretty confident that I think, you know, all the financial institutions, a large number of financial institutions, uh, majority of them would be very responsible. And I think they would be more than happy to come on board. I, I would not basically say that people want to hide behind anything. I think it's just that they want to make sure that something you don't want to have, a, you know, people are generally concerned about evangelical sort of an approach, you know, but if you're doing a more pragmatic approach and a very scientific driven approach, pretty confident that FIs and others would come on board. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, moving on to a couple of other questions, and I, I'm kind of seeing that some of the questions that I wanted to ask are also answered by, uh, are also kind of put by our audience. So I'm just kind of using that time to uh, get to those questions. So one question I think ISA from IFC has asked, uh, is there any indication from the Indian government that they will take the TCFT or climate risk disclosure in general mandatory? Uh, ISA, I can answer the question because uh, we did the study and uh, there is a brief mention from RBI that they want to factor in the climate risk uh, and disclosures in their guidelines. 
but nothing concrete it's not yet mandatory it is just that they are advising financial institution to be more cognizant of climate risk but they have not prescribed any action they have not prescribed any framework they have not made it mandatory but i think that would be something that we're looking at uh, if uh, anuva i can ask one question and i think this is also coming from some of the uh, audience is that in your initial remarks you talked about uh, data skill uh, uh, and kind of models uh, to be missing you know in order to kind of make this whole work uh, being mainstream of climate pricing uh, can you just uh, please unmute uh, anuva i think uh, I, this question through has so please so anuva the question was that in in the sector especially in india we have not seen a lot of uh, uh data skills or data disclosures uh, or, or any kind of methodologies being talked openly about that is this a barrier or or is there anything that we can do about that unep is doing anything on promoting how we can get more data on the climate variables uh, to be available and more uh, methodology to be uh, broadly available yeah thanks santosh for your question so uh, as i understood you are uh, talking about or uh, you are asking about the methodology which is available as of now and the data sets which are not available are they required and what is no. unep doing it let me let me rephrase it i'm saying that there is a big you know problem big problem in the uh, sector that there are not many people who understand what kind of data is required they don't know what are the methodologies available yes. and they don't have the skills required to kind of analyze the data and see that how the climate change uh, risk is applicable so is there unep uh, initiative uh, that is factoring these things in and doing something about that so uh, the unep initiative as of now in india is not on uh, climate risk pricing mechanism but we are definitely looking forward uh, to getting some partners on board of course we have lot of international work so we have this um, um, internationally we have we are part of several networks and uh, we are of course we have the tools and uh, of course this tcfd report and the scenario analysis uh, um, uh, the sector level results also are there then uh, there are certain core recommendations from the unep's uh, international work of course so uh, we'll be very happy to have partners on board who can work with us for taking this forward in india as of now we don't have much deep diving diving work in uh, climate risk pricing uh, unep has recently started its work on a climate risk entity of course so we have submitted a concept report to ministry of environment forest and climate change for a climate risk uh, entity which is on similar lines not exactly similar but very same lines uh, with the african risk entity so that is one important work that unep will be leading apart from that we have work on uh... sorry i've lost you for half a second yeah anuvar you there some connection problem i think yeah yeah okay okay i i'll move to the next question and when she comes i think i'll uh, ask her to uh, repeat so so uh, my next couple of questions are to mangesh uh, uh, this is something that i got from audience and one of my own i'm clubbing it to uh, uh, you mangesh so one is that what is the sort of traction that swissri has seen from the agtech and agri business enterprises uh, and 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 uh, are you partnering with them uh, and and the kind of the two tools that you made uh, you know, mentioned sustainability score and exposure risk has it be has they been adopted by state government or other institutions so so there are the two questions and one question of my own uh, you talked about your uh, you know uh, uh, framework or the tool that you have sigma uh, uh, and and i want to uh, you know uh, what i get a sense uh, from you is that sigma is the tool available for uh, large uh, public or any institution to kind of use that do you have the users data can we get some data on whether the indian financial institutions are proactively using it Uh, that would kind of highlight some kind of interest coming from Indian financial institution in that. So, three questions, Mangesh, if you can uh, please unmute yeah, Mangesh and sure. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll just uh, go in the reverse direction, perhaps. So Sigma is more like a reporting uh, uh, tool. Uh, there is another uh, report which uh, comes out on a regular basis from Swiss Re Institute. Uh, that's also. 
called as sigma so this is more like a electronic uh, uh, interactive version uh, that i mentioned uh, earlier uh, i think to to a certain extent uh, the uh, data uh, related to uh, natural catastrophes and uh, the impact uh, is aggregated at a certain level so i believe at the financial institution level i don't think sigma gives uh, any uh, insights uh, it it is at a much more non granular level i would say um, regarding uh, your second question i think there is uh, appears so to two be questions a... mangesh one was uh, you know egg tech and agri business enterprises uh, yeah. uh, what are the facts you are saying yeah. yeah so i think uh, regarding regarding the second question which is uh, related to the scoring mechanism uh, whether it is adopted by any of the governments i would say no uh, the scoring mechanism that i had mentioned uh, about uh, earlier uh, is something which is adopted uh, or rather being adopted by uh, swiss re for the internal risk assessment purposes uh, but I, i believe i think the fundamentals are uh, pretty straightforward and uh, i believe these sort of uh, frameworks can easily be fine tuned for the use of sovereigns uh, for the use of state governments why not i think that's that's a good idea i would say. Uh, as far as the first uh, question is concerned whether we have collaborated with uh, any of the actec uh, uh, companies uh, rather uh, there are quite a few uh, actecs which are coming up very interesting uh, work they are doing uh, we uh, on and off uh, collaborate uh, with them either uh, on a regular basis or uh, on ad hoc basis one of uh, such examples uh is uh, vandersat uh, which is a dutch uh, a company it uh, delves into soil moisture uh, they have done a lot of research uh, to provide uh, data uh, related to granular soil moisture and that actually helps us in understanding how uh, stressed the land is uh, when it comes to the water availability and i think that's an uh, that's a very good tool because uh, it actually gives you a historical perspective as well about the normal soil moisture available and then the current soil moisture uh, to understand uh, you know the effect of the drought impending drought or effect effect of the current flood situation so i think there is a lot of scope uh, uh, around uh, collaborating with the actec uh, uh, companies and we are uh, always open uh, for such dialogues Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Mangesh. So, so uh, my next question is to Mr. Uh, uh, Sanjay. Sanjay, if you can uh, answer a few questions that I have from the audience, and uh, you know, one question of myself. Uh, so, the one question from the audience is that: What could be the explicit, uh, explicit climate risk factors to carry a rating exercise? And also, any comment on the weightage of these factors in the rating exercise? So, the question is that. do you have some visibility of what kind of factors should go into your credit rating exercises and and if they go what kind of weightage do you see uh, uh, assigned to that i think a weightage i understand that uh, is a very complicated process we look at in different scenarios so but uh, your uh, take on that and another uh, point that i had for you is that you mentioned the credit ratings being off the horizon of around 10 years but uh do you see uh, a change or do you see a need for different rating processes when you rate the real estate businesses or the nbfcs or institution exposed to real estate because in that case the uh, horizon is surely more than 10 years and then those those are kind of more exposed to the climate risk uh, as well i'm not talking about weather risk but climate risk uh, you know water table going down the frequency and intensity of the rains uh, creating havoc uh, so your thoughts on these two yeah thank you santosh uh, for this question uh, so the first question you are saying is uh, how do we see the uh, what are the factors we see as coming into the rating process or the rating models and uh, uh, what are the various uh, aspects of those uh, of those processes which come from the climate risk uh, part of it right yeah uh, now as i said i mean as i said in my opening remarks uh, uh, see what happens is uh, You, when you do a quantitative modeling and that is when you use the various sub factors the quantitative modeling generally focuses on 2 3 years uh, going forward even if the instrument is let's say 5 to 10 years of uh, tenure because you rarely have any instrument which is more than let's say 10 years of tenure and even if you have such in, uh, instruments you have a call or put action at the middle of such tenure so that actually reduces the tenure of the instrument 
So when you're looking at uh, the tenures of uh, five to ten years, uh, and you focus on two to three years, then obviously a lot of the uh, the parameters of climate risk take a backseat on a very explicit basis. As I said earlier, it's only the implicit factors which take uh, which are taken into account. So if you are on a uh, solar, uh, let's say a solar genco, then probably you will get a better scoring as compared to because you are in the renewable energy space, uh, you are you are favored by the regulators, uh, you have access to international funds of green bonds, etc. So your liquidity is better. So th that is how these uh, things are factored in, rather than they being factored in on a uh, very explicit basis of uh, the climate risk impact on the location of the plant and on the franchise or the customer base or something like that. And on the other aspect of real estate players, so one is you don't have too many real estate players into the rating industry because a lot of them are financed bilaterally and because of the risk weight prescribed by RBI under the Basel II or Basel III framework, there's not much of a benefit for getting a real estate player rated. So you don't have too many ratings for them. Uh, number one, number two, the again the ten, in India you don't have a long-term bond tenure market as such, so you don't have very long tenure bonds and long tenure instruments uh, coming out there. So you there also you don't have instruments of let's say, so you have two types of players who need uh, two or three types of players who need long tenure instruments. One is the real estate player, the other is the uh, road toll roads and, uh, and the annuity road projects. And third is the uh, your uh, solar and uh, thermal power plants. Now, in all these three players, uh, the uh, the the period after certain uh, the the assessment after certain period of time actually becomes more driven by the promoters and the management and the organization to be able to take care of those risks. Having said that, as I said earlier, the ab initio you do factor in the uh, the reality that a solar power company would. Uh, normally be better placed in terms of being able to handle the climate risk and uh, the environmental aspects of uh, business rather than a thermal power company where the uh, as uh, Vijay has also mentioned uh, the uh, carbon intensity will continue to play against the ecosystem of that company and continue to bring it down so so that is how this uh, thing works thanks Sanjay so so I think you know from a, a bond market certainly uh, that sector is not that uh, uh, relevant, but in terms of the overall financial sector's exposure, that's a sector that we need to factor in. So uh, we'll kind of consider that separately. Uh, a couple of questions for Toby. If you are there, Toby, uh, if you can go on unmute. One question yeah. I wanted to understand that when a financial institution understand that, that there is a risk in their portfolio, how do you take that conversation from you know making that person realize that there's a risk and preparing for you know, uh, concrete steps to, uh, you know, kind of consider. One of the thing I see that any concrete step, it is whether it's a financial commitment or, a, a, you know, uh, subscribing to a new kind of uh, a framework or a new kind of uh, uh, instrument has a lot of focus uh, from top to bottom, like all the kind of uh, institutional mechanism has to be tuned to, the board has to agree to. So can you see that how, how easy or difficult it is? Because once say, I understand the financial risk, how difficult or easy it is for me to uh, act on that? Um, that's, that's, that's a very good question. So typically we're talking to the, the, the CFO rather than the, the risk officer. This is a sort of a, a financial sort of business, um, business decisions about how they should be allocating the resources and how they should be looking at different risks on a financial sense rather than risks across the business on the whole. Um, organizations often have a good analysis or understanding of their portfolios, where they're positioned, what money is where, how they can fix, fix that together. And if you could link that, what we call exposure, to, um, to the indexes or to the views of risk, you can get a very good view of how your business is affected by different risks at different places at different, at different times. Um, so that's sort of a first view. So you get, your, you get your analysis of your business and you can start understanding where things go. And you can look at that as a, in a historical way as well. So you can understand you know, in, in times past how your business was affected when you link the sort of historical view of the risk against your historical portfolio performance. And then you can, you can see that. So that's, a, that's sort of stage one. Um, stage two is obviously taking that to the, the board and understanding, okay, this is, we, have a, we have a situation here that could either be beneficial to us or could, be, or could hold us back um, and get the next sort of agreement to actually start thinking about financial solutions around that. How, how are we gonna, what we call this as anticipatory financial solutions around that. Then it's sort of 
the next step is, is what we call structuring a solution or structuring the product, understanding what the main um, triggers are, what the main issues are. When, when you start, um, at a point when you, your resource reserves are going to go low or, or high, or what you need to sort of stay in business, what we call you know, business continuity rather than business interruption, the amount of money you need to keep things going. Um, an example could be if you have a large um, agricultural lending portfolio um, and then there is a drought, a very, a very simple one. Um, what, at, at what level does your business, at that, what level can you carry on your business, can it sustain? Is it when your, um, when your portfolio drops 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, at what level is that? And so then you work out sort of a monetary amount to keep you going. You link that then to the, to the risk and you can create a, sort of a financial product. Um, and then the decision is, well, what, how, do I, how do I best um, use that financial product? Do I use it in the case it's, um, I can borrow money? So is it this become a lending decision? So this, then I go out to lenders and say, all right, if this situation happens, can I get borrow money at a preferential rate? Or do you think actually I need more um, and I need insurance or, or risk transfer or a, a hedge? So you can start making those decisions. Once you have those um, sort of almost a, a, a quiver of arrows, you then go to your, then it gets, it gets taken to the board level just to think about, okay, what strategies should we put in place? On that side, so it's a it's a, it's a company wide decision when you start looking at it on, on, on that level, um, and that's when you're a big organisation who's got a big portfolio as well. Think about it on, on that side. When you're a smaller organisation, then it's much it's a much easier question. It's much more um, how much can I how much can I lose? Uh, how much can I be willing to spend to make sure I don't get those losses? And then um, what is my potential growth as well? So for instance, if you're a if, you know, if, you've got, if you're a supply chain management company and you're looking to grow into, um, into parts of, of India where there's heavy rain, uh, how do I protect myself from those heavy rain stopping that supply chain? Um, what, the, what would the cost, what is the opportunity cost of, of, of not buying the product compared to buying the product? So it's those kind of decisions um, which they go through. So it's primarily the, the kind of financial discussions highlighting them that, okay, this is the money, uh, this is the portfolio risk, this is how much you're going to lose. That's the major driver. So once they start seeing the risk. So it's, it's the idea, it's, it's not like insurance where something happens and then you get your losses back. It's, just, it's the idea of what you, it's a sort of pre, it's sort of pre-insurance or you're basically working out what can, I afford, what can I afford to lose and how do I protect, how do I protect that? Or what can I afford to lose and how do I protect that? So, so the question has a particular kind of fever for me because of the discussion. So the question is that in some cases, the climate risk is factor because there is a guideline. In some cases, people act because there's a threat to their bottom line. Yeah. So both the scenarios uh, are kind of there. So while the large institutions are looking for a regulatory guideline to kind of, uh, you know, factor in climate risk, while some institutions proactively act because there's a threat to their bottom line. And that's why they, uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions, I think, uh, and suggestion I'm reading out for that. And then I have a last question that I would ask to every panelist, which would be, uh, you know, just think your thought through, what are the two, three suggestions from your side that could help the roadmap for financial institution to mainstream the climate risk? So think about it uh, while I'm kind of uh, uh, answering to a few questions or suggestions. So. Uh, there is one uh, question for Vijay, um, uh, but I, I think I can uh, answer and Vijay can add to that when he's giving the response. The question is that, is there any specific regulatory requirement or a standard methodology for climate stress testing? Till now, issued by any central bank. Addition to this, while doing stress testing, should the model methodology capture dynamic interaction between climate change, macroeconomic, financial, uh, financial systems, and environmental policies? Uh, if any advancement on climate stress this model, if you know. So so I think uh, there's a question from Marindam and Bijay, you can add to when you are responding to that, a quick response to this uh, Arindam is that there are no standard methodologies, uh, uh, you know, that is kind of globally uh, norm. There are multiple methodologies being used by different. The tool that uh, Bijay mentioned is available uh, uh, on the uh, TCFD website, as well as on the uh, greening of network of financial institution. Uh, it's an Excel sheet. You can download it, put the data and see uh, how your portfolio is kind of factoring in all those risks and what you need to do that. So Bank of England, use the tool and made it available for anyone to kind of use the tool. But there are several other tools. And uh, while doing the stress testing, one of the things that Bija was highlighting in the IMF study 
uh, it came out very clearly that when you are part of a different kind of uh, macroeconomic rule or a sovereign rule, you respond to the climate risk differently. And your resilience to climate risk is also different. In fact, the, the stock price age did not act the same way to a climate risk in different countries. In some countries, they were more resilient despite the being severely affected by the climate risk in some countries they were there. So it clearly has a big interaction between the countries, uh, macroeconomic situations and the response to that crisis. Uh, but I would let, uh, you know, um, Vijay talk about that. There's another suggestion uh, uh, or a comment coming from Asis Chiksena from uh, GIP India. He, he, the ESG director, he's saying that someone at the government of India level or at an industry association level need to think about how to trickle down uh, uh, you know, India's NDC target at the company level so that we can achieve the scenarios uh, under the two degree temperature. So basically he's saying that India's INDC targets, how we can, uh, you know, uh, factor in at the company level so that uh, if the company achieve those targets, the larger country uh, achieve that. I think, uh, Asis, we can discuss this. Uh, I'm not putting it for discussion, but this is something a good point to understand that how the INDC roadmap can start focusing more on uh, uh, making it a bit more participatory so a different institution can participate to meet the country's INDC uh, goals. Uh, I think that's the uh, comment he had. There are a couple of questions on um, what kind of return you get from a climate change investment. These are uh, surely not the climate risk questions. The returns are de you know dependent on many variables, but uh, climate you know climate related investments are as good or bad, as rewarding or as less rewarding, depending on the sectors and the business models that you're looking at. So there is no generic rule uh, there. And then I have a suggestion from Village Data Analytics. Uh, Sefali is saying that uh, they have an AI powered uh, software for analysis of satellite imagery and ground truth of health financiers make data driven decisions. So uh, those who are looking to get insight from uh, some of the you know uh, firms who provide support services, uh, Cephalic farm can provide some analysis of uh, you know your uh, exposures based on the data. If I understand this, uh, you know clearly. Uh, so these were some of the questions coming to us. Uh, so the question that I want to do, and and I, I think in between I just stop for a second and see if Pusta, you have any additional question to the panel before I go to my last question, which is, you know, how do you see the roadmap for FIs? to mainstream climate risk in their operations. What are the two, three suggestions from your side? It can be, uh, you know, on a policy, on kind of uh, tools or, or a different mechanisms open to that. But uh, uh, Pusta, over to you if you have any questions. No, Santosh, thank you. I, th I think uh, you and some of the uh, uh, contributors have covered most of the questions I did have. So over to the panelists to hear from them. Okay, so so this is the last question. We will be closing it at uh, five thirty. It's a hard stop. So, uh, Vijay, if I may dare to ask you this question, what is your three pointers on how we can mainstream climate risk in financial institution in India? Uh, thanks a lot, Santosh. Uh, uh, on the on the point, is there a global methodology? And I think you have covered that. I don't want to elaborate any further. There is. Uh, uh, nothing as sort of an agreed methodology. I think a lot of regulators are figuring it out. Uh, the closest that uh, we have is basically a sort of an approach paper, you know, that has uh, come out from this network for greening of the financial system by the central bank governors and regulators. That's the closest that has come in. And I think institutions are evolving. Like I know that IMF has developed its own stress test methodology for climate related stress on the financial systems. And I'm sure that several central banks have basically investing and developing. And I'm sure that there will be some convergence at some point in time. Now, the three things that I would like to highlight is, uh, I think first and foremost, uh, I think it's time for financial institutions, policymakers, regulators, uh, everyone involved is first and foremost to very clearly acknowledge and also to basically uh, accept and uh, acknowledge the urgency of the need for looking at climate related risk and its impact on the financial system. I think this is uh, the first and foremost because I think we need to move away if at all there is that 1% of the community which is there in the denial mode to basically uh, you know accept the fact that this is real and this is immediate and we need to move forward that I think uh, you know, accepting that in itself is a first big movement uh, and by all the policymakers and regulators and financial institutions alike. 
Second, what I see is a lot of, uh, you know, agencies uh, which are involved, whether it is uh, the, uh, the accounting uh, agencies uh, like the ICAFAI in India's or uh, the company's uh, secretariat or ICWS and all those things, they also have to start looking at and thinking what would be the implications of methodologies. For instance, uh, what we would for certainly foresee is the capital depreciation rates are going to be increasing. Yeah, because say for example, if people who have invested and lent to fossil fuel type of power plants, I'm sure that the, cap, the capital depreciation rates are going to be increased to acknowledge for the fact that there is an underlying change in the transition risk that is taking place in the low carbon environment and I need to depreciate my sort of an investment as quick as possible. So how is that going to happen? What is the role of the accounting professionals? What is the role of the uh, regulators and everyone to look into it and acknowledge uh, that sort of a thing. I think that is something uh, one needs to basically be looking at. Number three is uh, I think people have to start, uh, you know, particularly for financial institutions, uh, which are basically, you know, what we are doing is uh, short term uh, deposit mobilization, long term uh, supporting long term investments. We need to look at the fact that how are the cash flows going to be impacted in terms of servicing the debt. I think that is again becoming uh, the real uh, sort of a challenge. Uh, particularly when you see the annual variability in the cash flows and related to climate change and climate risk factors. I think that is something now FIs will have to factor in is how are they going to be looking at and reflecting on some of these things, particularly if you look at uh, in an Indian context, uh, the three sort of major areas which could uh, potentially be impacted in the immediate future. One is obviously the agri sector and I think Mangesh has very clearly touched upon it. And we are seeing that even in the recent, uh, you know, financial budget, the uh, Minister for Finance has announced that we are going to be lending some, the tune of around 18 lakh or 20 lakh crores or whatever it is, so to agriculture sectors. So that's a sector which is directly impacted by climate change and how or what and what the financial institutions are doing. Second one is the energy sector, what financial institutions are doing, how are they factoring? Third one is the uh, MSME, the tourism sectors and other things which are again significantly impacted. How are these? So you may not want to look at your entire portfolios of lending pick up you know two or three lines of business where you have significant exposures and start looking at what is what is that you as a financial institution start uh, need to be looking at uh, and what sort of risk mitigation mechanisms are you putting in place so let me stop there thanks Vijay thank you uh, Toby your take on what could be the three and quick three pointers three bullet points as a consultants do um, I think it's three things it's um, as you as um, Vijay mentioned before, it's understanding what, your, what the impacts are on your business, um, thinking about ways of, of mitigating those impacts, whether that's financial ways or it's um, infrastructure ways or any kind of on that side. So your ability, basically building in resilience measures to that. And then finally, I think it, what's key is this idea of transparency. So, that they under, so there's a, a level of understanding both from the um, investor, investee, lender, and lendee about what those risks are and sort of working together on that. For me, that's, that would be important. Great. Thanks, uh, Toby. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, your three pointers. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Santosh, Ankit, and uh, the whole team for organizing such a wonderful uh, webinar. The idea that I would have is uh, more related to expanding the whole concept and getting the knowledge through the system uh, rather than trying to push it because uh, I think you have to focus at the larger players rather than the whole system as such. So my suggestion would be that we probably have a central government and the state government to put in climate risk budgets on a yearly basis, like the way they do financial budgets. And then uh, we expand that to have these budgets or uh, reports published by, let's say, the first top top 100 companies. And then in a period of a couple of years, expand it to top 200, and not necessarily the financial institutions. The system should be able to understand the impact and uh, take the last ticket items first rather than uh, expanding to the smaller tickets and uh, dissipating the whole, um, because timelines are limited and uh, they have to be acted upon in a very strong manner. Thank you. Uh, Mangesh, if I I'll can just, ask you to... I'll just confine myself to two points. One is a regulatory approach to uh, build uh, climate resilience to protect the balance sheet, either through insurance or through a, uh, insurance like pool. Uh, some bit is already done, at least in agro, where the crop insurance is linked with bank loans. But I think vast MFI segment remains uncovered. So something should be done uh, for uh, these portfolios. And second point is encouraging uh, data providing uh, agencies to come forward and have a 
broader dialogue with the government to increase the collaboration on this topic because we might keep on talking about climate change but we can't move ahead much uh, concretely without uh, good data sets so yeah please thank you mangesh thanks uh, anubhav ji can i ask you to provide your suggestions yeah in fact most of the suggestions i have already put on the table so the regulatory side is very important so we need the disclosure requirements because rbi as of now does not have a climate change uh, department it is with the their i guess priority sector or farm sector merged with that department so sebi and rbi they need to come out with uh, the disclosure requirement it's not uh, not in my backyard approach that's not going to work the second uh, recommendation is standardization and harmonization of approaches and the third one is just linking it to the agro sector will not work because it has impacts and this is also very short term in nature because whatever we have in agriculture that is also for quick disaster relief so we should look at other sectors in fact urban bodies uh, panchayat panchayati raj institutions and other uh, wherever the appetite for investment is there so it has to be broad based so these three suggestions yeah, thank you i, I think uh, you guys have summarized all the uh, key points but you know the overarching theme that comes out that regulatory uh, supervision the the idea of a central bank stepping in and putting it mandatory uh, to have the disclosures and to have those regulations is very very critical for a space like this because uh, there's a huge implication in terms of the exposure to the entire uh, financial system uh, i would not go into the details but i would just want to i like one or two points that what we are doing in this and and sakti uh, has taken a whole approach to take this discussion to the next level how we can get more financial institution to voluntarily agree and to sign the tcfd and how we can work with policy and regulatory uh, enablers to make sure that uh, the discussions are taken to a, a you know a conclusion so uh, we will keep you updated the report is going to be out in 3 to 4 weeks uh, is it, just we'll factor in some of the suggestions here and we'll be sharing with things Uh, and and post that we'll like to engage with all of you who has participated to see how we can agree and work on the topics that we have just all uh, dwelt upon so with this i think uh, i would like to thank all my uh, you know audience members panelists and uh, partners who have been very very vocal in giving feedbacks for the entire study and uh, we will keep on uh, in you know informing you about the next steps and how, what we are doing but uh, you know in terms of uh, this panel discussion this has been a very very uh, educative and very very informative for all of us and very engaging as well considering the question that we have got so uh, a big thank you from sakti foundation and uh, intelicap and all of those who are working on this uh, report and this is a larger group of people it's not only we to have been only the uh, names but there are a lot of people who commented and given opinion so uh, we thank you a lot and and we wish you all the best uh, for whatever uh, uh, you know kind of going to do for the rest of the day and uh, uh, we look forward to engaging with you in a more uh, uh, you know engaging physical environment sometime soon we we have been uh, missing that but thank you uh, very much pushta over to you for uh, uh, any last comment or a big thank you from your side you have been the champion for this cause thank you so much santosh uh, again uh, thank you uh santosh vikas entire intellicap team for uh, doing uh, such an excellent study and then having uh, uh this convening and and this has been a very fruitful convening um from shakti side i think this was this has been a great uh, first step in our work on climate risk and climate risk with regards to the financial institutions in india uh, and we continue to hope that we will get to engage further with uh, all of you who are here on the call the larger uh, stakeholders that are out there regulators um, and, and we hope to turn this into some sort of movement where where uh, in a couple of years down the line we are able to see at least the concept of climate risk uh, getting mainstreamed amongst financial institutions in india given how important it is to our national context so thank you so much uh, santosh and thank you everybody for who participated and thank you uh, especially to our my co panelists today uh, is vikas online or uh, no, vikas? vikas is not online sir okay so vikas has to leave but uh, on behalf of vikas and intellect capital the no, team again thank you very much uh, for joining 
and we look forward to engage with you thank you thank you very much thank, thank you, so you much. everyone thanks for having this conversation starting this discourse thank you.